Hey folks, welcome to The Artist Craft. I'm your host, Stacey Cochran, and today we have in studio author Heather St. Alban Stout, uh, whose memoir chronicles her uh, triumphant battle with breast cancer and her reflection on her, her own mother's uh, battle with breast cancer. The title of the memoir is Not My Mother's Journey. Uh, Heather, thank you very much for joining us in studio today. Thank you for having me. So tell us uh, about uh, Not My Mother's Journey. What's this story about? Well, after uh, my, I, I was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2006, and after it reoccurred in 2007, I was thinking that writing and sharing my story would help others that are going through it, especially because I had lost my mom to breast cancer in 1987 and I saw a big difference in what she went through in the 80s and what I went through in 2006, 2007. So I felt like this was a story that needed to be told, but um, also it, I talk a lot in the book about the difference in the treatment of breast cancer from the 80s to 2000 and the support groups and everything that's out there and available to uh, people going through this. How was your battle different? It sounds like, you know, 20 years, a, a world of, of difference has, uh, you know, been put in front of people who are, are battling cancer, uh, specifically breast cancer. So how was your battle different than your mother's? I think because my mother went through it, I was more aware of the early detection in the mammograms. Um, my mother found a lump in her breast in 1986 and was told to watch it. And within a couple months it had grown and it was stage three. And at that time, you know, they did a mastectomy and some chemo, but uh, it re hers metastasized within a year, which is why the one year mark for me was such a big deal to get past that. Mine was found through ma a mammogram the first time, an MRI the second time, so both of them were screenings, but they were both very early. They were aggressive forms, but I didn't have a lump, and I felt fine. Um, there were microcalcifications. They were not watched. They were biopsied and taken care of right away, and I had an aggressive form of treatment, and I, I do believe that's why I'm here today. So I think that and the fact that it's talked about more. The, the internet is here. There's support out there even if you don't want to physically go to a support group. And that's part of what the book is about. You can't go through this alone. Um, and I saw my mom go through it alone. It wasn't really talked about. And because I have a big mouth, I told everybody what I was going through and the help was there. Is it possible for you to put into words the pervasive emotions uh, of the time when you're, when you're battling uh, cancer yourself? Is it anxiety a lot of the time? What, is, what are the dominant emotions that you have? I think when you hear those words, you have cancer or it was positive, it's malignant. Uh, yes, there's a lot of anxiety because you're not sure what you're gonna do to combat this. Um, once you, I, I interviewed, and that's another message in the book, to be your own best advocate. Surgeons, doctors, oncologists all have many patients and you only have you. So, you know, get out there and talk with other people that have been through it, research as much as you can, bring the questions to your doctors, and then once you choose your team, trust them and then attack it. So the anxiety at that point for me is gone because you're doing something about it and you're in treatment. Um, then when you're done with treatment, I found that was a difficult time period as well. And that's when I needed the support because I think, and from what I've found in the past year since the book's been released and talking with other women, there's a lot of anxiety then about reoccurrence. What will I do if it comes back? Um, and now that it's been about four years for me, I'm finding that I have a peace knowing that if it does come back and there is a chance that it could, um, I don't think you're ever cured 100%, um, you'll deal with it. So you live each day the best you can and um, 
go from there. Have you met people who, uh, it sounds like you're a fighter by nature and you caught this early. You had the experience of watching your mother battle this unsuccessfully uh, as a, you know, as a, you know, something on your radar that you had to look into early. Have you met women who uh, are, you know, th when they suspect something, they take too long to get it looked at or that there's some sort of just depression involved with, you know, fighting it right out of the gates? Is, is, is that something that you've seen as a common thread? Yes, and I know I didn't, I kind of skipped over when I was in treatment. I think, um, when you're when you are in treatment there's not as much the anxiety but there is a depression it kind of comes and goes um, but then there's also a sense of this is there I, my faith played a great role for me so that was helpful and uh, I think there are still women out there that are not getting their mammograms and part of that is because they are concerned that something might be there and then they're, they have to deal with it. But what I'm trying to, to say is the early detection, if it is there, get it out, get it taken care of. Um, and so, yes, there's, well, it's a, it's a big mix of emotions. How, is, how are the emotions different uh, looking back, you know, over 20 years uh, in, uh, you know, coming to terms with your own parent passing and battling something like this in contrast to your own, uh, are the emotions similar, uh, different? Well, they, they are different. Um, I know when my mom was going through it, she always said it was better her than me. And so when I was going through treatment, if I saw a child or I know of children that have, you know, I, I felt the same way. Thank goodness it's me and not one of my kids. Um, However, I guess, you know, I always thought my mom was kind of old, and here I was the same age when I was diagnosed, and, and I feel really young, and I've got a lot left to do. So there is that kind of panicky feeling like, wait a minute, I'm not done, don't take me yet. Um, but it is different because you can't do, I wanted to take it away when my mom was going through it. And, and I hurt for her, but it was something that she had to deal with and go through, and you as, as a loved one have to honor her wishes. And she was dealing with it the best she knew how. And, and I say that because she didn't stop smoking. <laughs> she loved her cigarettes, and that was very frustrating for me as a daughter. I, was, I just felt like she was killing herself, but I had to honor that. That was something that I think she knew. she wasn't going to get better. And so this is something she wanted to enjoy as long as she could. How do you let go? Uh, because you want to con you want to take care of somebody uh, and then maybe there's even uh, you know on your mother's part resistance to you know just let me deal with this the way I want to deal with it and how do you navigate that tug of war? I'm better at it now. <laughs> I think some of that comes with maturity. And I think some of that comes with talking with other people that have been through it. And, you know, when I lost my mother, you know, she was 45, I was 24, and I was very angry at God, and I couldn't understand why I was going through this. But almost 25 years later, I feel like I've been able to help other people who are dealing with their parent that is ill. And they're frustrated because they want to help them in a certain way that the parent doesn't, you know, maybe the parent needs a caregiver full time and they don't want that. And so. So what advice do you give for somebody like that? I'm sure we to have back off. Like, <laughs> let them decide for themselves. Yeah, just to be there for them, to listen, to, to really pay attention to what, I, and you know, going back to the cigarette, thing. Uh, my mom went into Duke for the last time and met with a therapist and within 10 minutes the therapist came out and asked for her oxygen to be turned off in the room and told a nurse to go get two cigarettes. This woman had given up smoking 15 years before and she was going to sit and have a cigarette with my mom. So that's a big lesson. She was listening to her and knew what she needed and uh, but she was trained. I was just the daughter.
<laughs> so one of the points you raise in Not My Mother's Journey uh, is simply how life continues on even in the midst of, a, a, of fighting for your own life. Uh, your kids are growing up in your story, uh, doing typical teenage things. Uh, how do you think your battle with cancer has impacted your kids? Now that we've got some perspective on it, I think it really did impact them. Um, I've had several incidents in the last year that showed me how much my kids really thought of me and how proud they are um, of me for what I'm doing now and what I went through. And at the time, I really, they didn't say much. I have three boys. They don't do a lot of talking. Um, in one sense, it was encouraging when the cancer reoccurred. They just said, oh, you'll get better, Mom. Whereas if I had three daughters, you know, we probably would have had a pity party together. And so at the time, I was kind of angry that they didn't seem to show more. But um, all three of the boys are uh, passing out my, my business cards and telling people about me and, and getting involved in different support groups. One's in LA, one's in Charlotte. The youngest one still lives at home. And every once in a while, I come across somebody that said, yeah, your son was telling me about you. He's really proud of you. And I'm just shocked, you know? <laughs> It's going to make you feel good. Yeah, we're, the parents are the last to know. <laughs> Do you think, uh, you know, it helps or hurts someone fighting, uh, you know, cancer uh, to have those kinds of uh, non-cancer related family issues that you've got to deal with, the kids have got to, you know, make it to school and, and they're griping about, you know, not being able to go out with who they want to on Friday night or, or whatever. Uh, you know, those family issues are. Uh, does it help to be able to focus on something else other than the cancer, or, or does that, do you wish ultimately that everybody was sort of rallying around the fight? At the time, I was wishing they would rally around me, but maybe it's because I'm the only woman in the house. <laughs> Um, interestingly, I, I was just talking with another survivor um, before I came here, and she, her children were very, very little when she was going through it. They were two and four, and she was telling me how she was in a support group at the time, and she was so thankful that she had her children that she had to take care of and be involved in that she didn't have time to sit and cry over what she was going through. and. So I think it helps. Hmm. <laughs> why did you want to write the book? What, why did you, as you started to write this and conceive of it, why did you, why did you want to write it? Well, I think it, it was a good medium for me. It was something I always wanted to do. And so despite what happens with the book, I can at least say that I, I started and, and finished it. Um, and, and have gotten it out there. But I also felt compelled to begin writing or say a, a new career in midlife, so to speak, um, because it was a story that I felt could help other people. So there, there was a reason behind it. And in the past year, I've, I've had really good feedback. Um, even if I've only been, you know, have one person come to a book signing, I always get something out of any event I've done, and I feel like I'm giving back. How long did it take to write? How long did the book take to write? Well, starting in 2006, uh, I, you know, when I was diagnosed in, in uh, October, I started keeping a couple of notebooks and journals. Um, one had all of my medical information in it, and then another one was just my feelings. And, and so that went on for a couple of years. And when I was done with the Herceptin at the end of 2008, in December, I started looking into compiling it. And then it took me about another year to compile it. And then, well, I guess four years altogether. Mm -hmm. Because I had an editor, and it, as you know, being an author, there's a lot of rewrites. Mm -hmm. The original manuscript was 750 pages, and she, we cut that down to about 300. So it went through several rounds of editing, and then several rounds of querying, and 
it, it was quite an interesting journey. But then I decided to self-publish um, or print on demand to go ahead and get the process moving along. And I still own the rights. Um, and that came out in January. And I find it's not over yet because you're still marketing. And so it continues. Mm. And, and yet it's, it's written as though it's a data account of of the story mm -hmm. you know you have the dates it's almost like it's a it's a journal and so that was one of the questions I had was uh, you know in how you structured this you've structured it you know chronologically uh, how did you decide on what would end up going in the book because it sounds like there was you know 750 pages nearly twice as long or three times as long as what the, the book's finished version is at this point um, how do you make a decision about, oh, this scene's not important to the story and this scene is, with no, something like my this? My editor. <laughs> it was great because I found her through another book that I had read and I really liked the book. And so because of the internet, I was able to contact her. She's out of Atlanta, had 40 years experience in the business and was just absolutely fabulous. Um, so I really credit her with making the book a better read than what if I had just tried to do it on my own. What are some of the ways that writing was a form of therapy for you? Uh, specifically, how did writing, not my mother's journey, uh, give you control over the events uh, that were happening to you? Well, I'm a very, or at least I like to think I'm an organized person, but I'm, I'm kind of a A-type personality. And so it gave me the control of organizing everything. And when things are organized for me, I feel like I've, I've got a little more control, mm -hmm. regardless whether or not I do. It's what, how I feel. <laughs> but mentally you feel as though you've got a better grasp of it, and that's a, yeah. that's a big part of, of, of a battle like that, I would imagine. You yeah. Know. Well, that's why, I, that's why I do, when I talk to people and write in the book, I recommend that you do a little research, and not that that's the end all, but you've got to find the right team and then once you know you find the team go ahead and, and bring all of your organizational material and and talk to other survivors and let your like i i had people come with me to every meeting um, my husband and my mother-in-law my sisters and i had a second set of ears and so that's another thing i think despite everything i went through with my mom when i actually heard those words i just kind of was like oh geez what do i do now so if it hadn't been for some friends that are in, that one's a nurse, the other one's a pharmaceutical rep, and you know, people really pointed me in the right direction. Mm -hmm. So despite everything I'd been through, when it does happen to you, you kind of go blank. So you need other people around to help point you in the right direction. No doubt. Do you feel uh, in writing, you know, the journal early on and taking notes and conceiving of this as a book, do you feel that you were able to make sense of the disease in your life? I thought I did until the reoccurrence. And then I realized it's kind of a free-for-all, <laughs> no matter what you do. You know, you, you just, you can't protect yourself or insulate yourself from it. You know, some people are gonna get it, some people are not, and I think that's true of, of any um, illness. You do what you can, and you do your best, and then if you do get it, you just deal with it. Would you like to read a passage from Not My Mother's Journey? Sure. Again, the author is Heather St. Alban Stout. The book is Not My Mother's Journey. Okay, this, this passage is right after my lumpectomy. I was better. Um, I was actually able to go on a field trip with my youngest son who was in sixth grade, and they were going to a camp um, to do some team building exercise. It says, um, November 13th, 2006. It's Monday morning and I feel so good that I agree to drive a field trip for Nick's class. It's a team building camp about 30 minutes away in the country. When I reach the school, Six 11-year-olds climb into the Suburban and wrestle over the controls for the DVD player. Nick brings out a movie and we're on our way. We get to the park and I decide to let the kids out and go park the car. They go on with their teachers. Later I find the trail I saw the kids take and trek down a hill over a creek with a rustic wooden bridge up a hill around several curves until I hear kids yelling words of encouragement to their classmates. 
I marvel at the beauty in the woods, the sunlight streaming through half-naked branches, the brilliance of the colors of the leaves that are left. I breathe deeply the fresh smell of the changing seasons. I approach the group to see everyone in helmets and harnesses, even the teacher, who is a nun from the Philippines in full habit and dress. She's going to go down the zip line, too. I stand off to the side, watching the kids climb one by one up into the air to a platform where they take turns with the zip line. They're laughing and yelling. The kids who are hesitant are encouraged and coaxed. The others fling themselves off the platform with glee into the air, trusting the gear, reveling in the free fall from one tree to the other. This is like life, I think. You need the support of others in your endeavors. You need the confidence that these activities build. And most of all, you need the feeling of freedom to be yourself. Hmm. That's Heather St. Albert Stout. The book is Not My Mother's Journey. So when you're writing specific scenes, let's talk a little bit about craft here with this. Uh, when you're writing specific scenes in the book with dialogue, how close to the actual words are the conversations? How much do you, you know, uh, wrestle with that? Um, and how do you make decisions regarding how to recreate specific scenes? I had a lot of help. <laughs> Again, just like my original journey. There were things that um, my sisters or my husband or my mother-in-law said, no, it didn't happen that way. <laughs> So they were reading it with me, uh, they were discussing it with me, and I had some mini editors, I guess you could say. <laughs> what support did you find most useful from a writing or a craft perspective as you wrote the story? Probably the internet. I mean, it's a wonderful resource. There's so many tools out there. Hmm. And what are your thoughts about writing groups? I probably need to get in one. How about writers' conferences? I'd like to go to some. I've recently just joined, um, well, I joined the Catholic Writers Guild and got their seal of approval. Um, this past spring, got the seal of approval in the summer, just joined the, the uh, North Carolina Writers Network. So I feel that it's important. So. so once you decided to turn your story into a book, what steps did you take? to help make people aware of Not My Mother's Journey? I guess just like what we're doing now, uh, networking, talking. Um, again, the internet's a great resource, Facebook, social networks. Um, but I also talked with our local bookstore owner. And I first uh, last, well, I guess it was about this time last year, started talking with him and looking at the indie bookstores. and. Then I'm finding it, it, the journey for me keeps evolving because it is kind of a niche book. Not everybody wants to read about cancer or think about cancer, whether you've gone through it or not. Huh. How about uh, support groups for uh, cancer survivors? Is that something that you've targeted as, as a speaker? Uh. Yes, and I'm trying to make myself available to more and more groups. There's so many events out there, fundraisers, and I'm finding that a lot of them do need a survivor speaker. And it's not my forte, but I'm kind of starting to like it. <laughs> sure. Uh, for someone who has been diagnosed with early stage cancer, uh, what do you do? What are the lifestyle changes that you would advise? I, I think the biggest thing, and I'm still learning this, is, is balance. Um, try to. You're not going to eliminate stress, but do things that you really enjoy. And I think it goes without saying that the exercise and the eating, uh, you know, moderation in, in all things. But um, that and, and the support and sharing the story, talking with other people, humor, faith. What kinds of exercise did you do as you, as you were fighting cancer? Walking. I used to be a runner, but I'm finding as I'm getting older, it's a little easier on my body to walk. I know that feeling very, very <laughs> well. Uh, if you had it to do over, God forbid, but if you had it to do over, what would you do differently? Probably nothing, to be honest. I think I did the best I could at the time, and like my boys are older now, They're, we're in different places, and uh, you know, so if, if I were to, to re, you know, experience a reoccurrence or a different type of cancer, I, I would just do the best I could at the time for the place I'm in. 
Would you say it's a lonely journey? No. Is it for some people though? And then how, uh, how, how can people who are, I sense that you're, you're, a, you're a bit of an extrovert, you're able to go out and, and, and <laughs> you know, talk about these things. Some people are terribly shy and they, you know, they're unable to, to reach out. So what, what advice would you give for someone who feels alone in this battle? The internet, <laughs> once again. I am amazed at the amount of groups out there. You don't have to leave your house. You don't have to interact uh, with anybody like we're doing here. You don't have to go to the hospital and sit in a, a circle. Um, I have actually corresponded with a lot of different people just via email. And to me, when I was going through it, that was the best thing. I would get really worn out and I didn't feel like talking on the phone or schlepping up to the hospital. So it's there if, if you want it. Hmm. Again, the author is Heather St. Alban Stout. The book is Not My Mother's Journey. Uh, I think it's an important story for, for anybody, of course, who's battling it or knows somebody who has battled breast cancer or cancer in general. Uh, so check it out, Not My Mother's Journey. We're coming down, I think, to our last minute or so here. Uh, so where do you go from here? What are you working on now? What's coming up? you know, for you uh, with Not My Mother's Journey in the next few months and year? Thanks for asking. Um, as far as this book goes, I'm setting up events for the coming year and I've got a, a busy beginning of the year um, for that. But I'm also getting ready to start uh, training and be a peer counselor for a, an organization called Why Me? And it's Y-M-E. And uh, that is actually a phone or internet support, but I, I need to be trained. It's, it's a group that's been around for a while out of Chicago. And then uh, I've also started uh, writing some fictional work, and I'm having fun with that when I get to it. It would be so good. I can see you on the phone giving people support. It would, you'd be very good at that, I would think. Thanks. I'm really excited about it. It's just something I believe in. And so I'm, I'm really, I feel like I'm being led down a new path, and I am. I'm very excited. Thanks. <laughs> Again, the author is Heather St. Alban Stout. The book is Not My Mother's Journey. Uh, check it out if you want to invite her to be a speaker for your group. Uh, there is a website. What's the website again? NotMyMother'sJourney.com. Simple enough. NotMyMother'sJourney.com. Uh, Heather, thank you very much for joining us in studio. Oh, thank you. Uh, for all of us here, Michael and Marnie working hard in the back, the folks over in Master Control, I want to thank you guys for tuning in. Thanks so much.